So shall we begin? Yeah, let's begin. This interview uh, is um, intended to kind of enhance the background um, that we can um, provide through the new TV TV kind of website that's being built right now. Right. Um, and uh, <clears throat> you'll be amongst the company of Alan Rucker, Megan Williams, Hudson Marquez, uh, Michael Schamberg. Uh, they've all been interviewed. And I'm going to also interview um, uh, Skip Blumberg and, and Tom Weinberg. And then I think Sounds I'll call good. it quits. <laughs> I know them all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you've worked with them in many different capacities, not just TV, TV. Um, but I was hoping we could go back to the very beginning and, um, you know, in the formative, uh, you know, uh, originating mythology of TV, TV, there is the original triumvirate, Michael, Allen, and Megan. And they then moved to San Francisco but Ant Farm seems to have already been, in a sense, um, accepted as part of that originating context. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about where you first um, uh, came into discussion with Schamberg and Megan and Alan, uh, maybe even prior to them moving here. Of course, Alan Rucker was already in Palo yeah. Alto, but... Uh, I think uh, it would be maybe as early as 1970 uh, or 71 when um, uh, Alan, Alan Rucker, along with Shelley Serpin, um, the media access people based in, I guess the, I guess that uh, Portola Institute was their nonprofit. And uh, they came in uh, to the Ant Farm Warehouse in Sausalito and did an interview with us. Um, and uh, of course, uh, shot on Porta Packs. And it was about, mostly about inflatables, because that's what we were sort of engaged with at that time. But um, I'm trying to remember if we had our own Porta Pack at that point in time. I, I think we did. And I think um, that uh, interaction with with uh, Rucker and, and, and his group was kind of opened the door to the larger community of guerrilla television. And so subsequently, um, <clears throat> probably during the media van tour, we, we call it that now, I don't think we called it that at the time, uh, we visited New York and, and uh, you know, visited the rain dance loft, I believe. Um, I think that's probably when I met Schamberg. I don't, I don't think I met Megan on that visit. Uh, <clears throat> Irish Schneider mm -hmm. was there. And, but um, out of that began a conversation and of course, the conversation mainly was around Radical Software, the publication sure. of guerrilla television or of the, the movement of uh, portable, um, possibly countercultural, you know, television making. And subsequent to that, we, uh, there was a West Coast edition of Radical Software. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess we did some design ant farm thing. We, um, Curtis mainly was the designer of the wraparound cover of that issue of Radical Software. Um, and I think because, uh, I'm trying to remember now, so that would have been, I think, in 19, late 1970 or 1971. <clears throat> And Farm was based in uh, mm -hmm. a warehouse in Sausalito, but uh, which most of us lived there. Hudson and I lived there. Doug Michael showed up at a certain point. He lived there. Uh, Curtis still had an apartment in, in uh, North Beach in San Francisco. 
And at the end of the summer in 1971, uh, we gave up the warehouse and uh, there was a kind of dispersion of Ant Farm uh, members or associates. And <clears throat> But around the same time, um, Schamberg had come to San Francisco and engaged us to design Guerrilla Television, which was, I think mm -hmm. at that point, a full manuscript and a stack of photos and illustrations that most of which had been used in uh, previous versions of Radical Software. Mm -hmm. And um, so <clears throat> we did that. The reason I'm uh, uh, the uh, the marker for me of time was that we we did that work in Curtis's apartment, the layout and design um, of the book, and you know a, a lot of it was simply pasting down the text, but um, mm -hmm. certain things like the table of contents, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, was a a beautiful drawing that Curtis did. So that was the um, initial interaction. And um, then what happened was that, uh, as I said, Amphar dispersed. Hudson and I moved to the country to a, um, a ranch uh, in uh, Laytonville, north, mm -hmm. north, north of San Francisco. And... Um, but Doug uh, Michaels had been in correspondence with Marilyn uh, Oshman in Houston about mm -hmm. the possibility of designing uh, a house on a, on a family property she she owned uh, with her sister outside of Houston, and um, he he did a lot of mail art, by the way, uh, that was part of the the beginning of the conversation of that, that project. And in maybe in October of 1971, um, he, he, Doug, drove up to Laytonville and said, let's go to Texas. You know, we've got this commission. So, uh, but Hudson stayed in, uh, Hudson and Betsy stayed in Laytonville, and I went with Doug and, and my girlfriend, Randy to mm -hmm. uh, to Texas, and we arrived there around Thanksgiving time, 1971, and that it was that began like, for for the next year and a half the the process of uh, designing and building what became known as the House of the Century. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we to keep Ant Farm alive, we had uh, we we had these uh, telecopiers, which you could you could feed a eight and a half by 11 drawing or letter into it and, and connect it to your phone and it would come out uh, at the destination, you know, an early form of like a fax. Uh, visual communication mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, long before email uh, with, with the San Francisco branch uh, mm -hmm. of Ant Farm. And eventually we connected, uh, you know, also with Schamberg and Rain Dance. So, as I think the the idea of doing the uh, political convention coverage was uh, developing, it was uh, I guess it was a question of which members of Rain Dance, which members of Ant Farm, and so forth. All of these groups kind of refigured a little bit around that project. Not not. Mm -hmm. Not all of the video freaks went to Miami, not uh, but the three main members of Ant Farm, uh, myself, uh, four, sorry, four, not yeah, three, yeah. Uh, Doug, Hudson, and Curtis, we all participated. And I know the, the I think the first uh, poster uh, gave Ant Farm a kind of co-founding of Top Value Television credit, along with mm -hmm. uh, Rain Dance, uh, in a technical sense. But in these, in this moment, which would have been the spring of '72, or the late spring, 
were were you still in Texas when this concept of going to Miami for July and August came about? Yes. And uh, so Doug and I uh, were in Texas, in, uh, in Houston, outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. Curtis was in San Francisco. Uh, Alan Rucker was in, I think, still in Palo Alto at that point. Yeah. And um, so there were, there, there's one very interesting uh, video letter that circulated between those three locations uh, uh, that Michael and Megan made in New York. Um, Curtis and Alan Rucker in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and then uh, Doug and I in uh, Angleton. And it was it, it was designed. It was supposed to be a kind of dialogue about uh, the project, but it was hardly uh, functional in that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the. Hey, do uh, you know if the tape still exists? I'm I'm pretty sure you have it over there. Oh, okay. It's called uh, Triptych. Triptych, okay. Yeah, uh, and it has three discrete segments that are uh, that were added in each place. Mm -hmm. And this was shot really just in that roll-up to uh, uh, everyone converging on Miami sometime in the late spring, early, early summer. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, I actually met Tom Weinberg because um, I I made a trip to Florida in June of 1972 uh, to attend my 10th high school reunion, <laughs> and because I that was in St. Petersburg, uh, and then I went, I think I went to Miami Beach where Tom was uh, an advanced man searching yes, for yes. the proper. Uh, you know, large house with a swimming pool where we could all uh, be based during the convention. Mm -hmm. And out of that experience, his uh, nickname became Score because he scored yeah. the house on Pine Tree Drive. I, I can't remember the address on Pine Tree Drive because, I, you know, a couple of years ago I was back in Miami Beach and I wanted to uh, revisit that location, but I wasn't able to. Uh, Tom certainly didn't remember, <laughs> and I and I didn't either. I wonder if it's in any of the scrapbooks. I wonder. Yeah, you have I those. Should... Oh yeah, and they're all digitized. I mean, every oh, right. item has been digitized, so uh, might be able to do a of search course. for it. It has to be <laughs> in the scrapbook somewhere. Yeah, there's actually great footage in the outtakes of you gluing things into the scrapbook you have a some kind of a, a glue stick in one hand and <laughs> i think polaroids in the other and you're building up the scrapbook mm -hmm. i don't know if there were glue sticks back then probably rubber cement yeah or something like that mucilage <laughs> so in okay so then you went back to texas after this brief run to Florida. But then when you converged, uh, as I recall, there is footage of Ant Farm arriving at the house in Miami and the and you, Curtis, and Doug are together. Right. So, so you didn't come from separate places at that point. You had grouped up and then headed to Miami or um. <clears throat> I think um, we we drove from Houston to Miami, but I'm not sure about Curtis. Oh. Uh, he might have he might have flown. I think he flew to Miami, and even though he appears in the arrival shot, he maybe came out to greet us as mm -hmm. we got out of the van. Uh, and I think Curtis and Hudson both flew to from San Francisco to Miami. Yeah, I think that Hudson, I think Hudson is already in the house. Because as I recall, there is footage following uh, you and Doug and Curtis through the house. And Curtis is looking for Hudson <laughs> <laughs> and finds him in the garage or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, so it, 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 there 
the basic decision from the beginning was that Ant Farm in its entirety would be represented uh, at the, in this TV TV project. That's right. Um, yeah, it, you know, uh, <clears throat> I think this an, an important thing to mention is that uh, you could say that Ant Farm uh, was a countercultural architecture uh, studio, but uh, all of us were uh, greatly influenced by the countercultural movement, the larger social movement that was going on. Uh, you know, it was represented by Woodstock in 1968, and uh, then on the dark side by Altamont. Uh, a year later, I guess, 69. And I think that same, uh, the same forces uh, hold for, you know, uh, on the East Coast where the video freaks uh, moved to the country uh, to get mm -hmm. out of the city, you know, which was a kind of uh, ethos of the counterculture. But um, there's, there's, all, there's a tension implicit in that because... Uh, just the way the media van it was a symbolic representation of that tension, let's say. You know, it was a hippie van, but it was also designed to be highly technological in mm -hmm. how it looked and functioned. Um, really, it didn't. It don't, we only had one porta pack, and we were and a, uh, a power converter so that we could uh, play back and and recharge the porter pack in the van. But beyond that, it didn't have any high-tech mm -hmm. you know, equipment. We didn't even have a CB, C, you know, CB radio at that time. Um, hmm. Now, speaking of the van, is that, does that become the TV TV van that is in Miami? Yeah, so that, um, you know, there was, there was a... Uh, a redesign of the media van that took place in in Texas, and um, and Doug Michael has kind of designed that this this remaking of it into a a, a gray vehicle. I mean, there, there's a, there's a number of aspects of that version, including a platform uh, that replaced the rear bumper, so that uh, a, a camera person could be standing. On the mm -hmm. van, and that would be that would get you above the crowd, let's say. And then the uh, the bubble in the van was enlarged, the central bubble uh, at that time, for the same reason to be able to get up with with a, a video camera. And uh, <clears throat> some of that was aesthetic, and some of it was functional. Uh, so the and and it wasn't really that conversion wasn't commissioned by. Uh, rain dance for top value television. It was, uh, you know, something that that uh, Doug and Ant Farm we wanted to do that. So then Curtis made <laughs> just using sheet vinyl that has adhesive on the back. He cut out the TV TV, uh, not so much logo, just the 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 uh, letters that were then applied to the van. Mm -hmm. uh, the same way you could put a magnetic sign on a van for the project of going to Miami. So, but the, the van was also used, the media van then was also used as, as a, a visual logo uh, preceding the actual production for mm -hmm. TV TV. And then the, the van itself was driven from Houston to Miami. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have one uh, wonderful photograph of it somewhere in northern Florida, just on the side of the road. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think we shot much video <laughs> along the way. But and then when when the uh, two conventions were over, you then took the van back and recommissioned it for Ant Farm. Well. Uh, we, we, I think we took the logo, the letters off. That was all, that was the only reconditioning. Okay. Uh, post 1972, um, 
and but it was you know continued to be the a, a kind of collective uh, vehicle of, of mm-hmm. the ant farm and um, I know I think in, in early 1973 I think I drove it to San Francisco and then back to Texas um, and then I know that uh, when the project was completed uh, Doug Michaels and I drove it packed up everything and drove from Houston back out to San Francisco mm-hmm. and uh, and we had met Stanley Marsh I mean there's another connection of Cadillac Ranch through this network of people uh, and I think it was really through Alan Rucker said uh, you know had a friend who knew Stanley Marsh and said you should you should meet him, and we began corresponding with him. So that was in a kind of a mail art network um, mm-hmm. that we uh, got to to know Stanley Marsh, and he said, "Well, come visit." And so on this trip from Houston back to California, we uh, detoured through Amarillo, spent a couple of days there, and and, and met uh, Stanley, who said as we were leaving. Uh, you seem very like very wholesome. I like Ant Farm. If you want to make a proposal to do a project together, I'm I'm open to that idea. Mm-hmm. And we did, and that was became, uh, you know, so that was in '73. So, you know, a year later, yeah, yeah, '74 Cadillac Ranch. <laughs> so back to Miami. Um, do you? Do you have impressions, you know, of, about how the organization of this kind of wrangling, f- rambling group of disparate personality types were put into a single building, somehow given assignments or not given assignments, and then let loose on the convention? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I, was, I, I mentioned this idea of the tension between a count, countercultural method, and, which is a kind of chaos, really, and, um, you know, something more traditional. And, of course, Schamberg had been a reporter for uh, time, I think. And uh, so he was actually functioning as a producer in Miami Beach, and mm-hmm. attempting to hand out assignments to the different uh, teams. The teams were uh, not put together by him, but were simply teams that already existed by who, you know, there was one ant farm uh, porter pack, so there was one ant farm team. Some, sometimes mm-hmm. it shifted in the personnel. Um, you know, likewise, uh, Steve Christensen, who was at Antioch College and had come from Ohio, and um, his, his uh, girlfriend uh, Martha Miller, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, that was another team. So it was so there so there were some assignments given, and but <clears throat> that generated you know <laughs> where she, where you would go today, <laughs> who you were following around. I think um, you know there's a there's a uh, chaotic quality to the Democratic Convention tape that reflects the Democratic Convention, probably, 1972. Um, but also, that was the, the first, you know, attempt. And so when we came back, uh, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks later, for the Republican Convention, I think Schamberg had, like, you know, was better organized as a producer. Of course, we would never, he would never, and we would never designate, you know, or call him the producer, but because it was a sense of collectivity. But, you know, the fact that he had uh, arranged the key element, the press credentials mm-hmm. uh, through Manhattan cable television, whatever it was, uh, you know, you can look in retrospect and say he was functioning as a producer of that tape. And, um, you know, often in tension with the ethos of collectivity, and we don't have any hierarchical uh, positions here. 
Um, but uh, the the one you know the, we, there were to get into the convention. I forget how many actual floor passes we had. There, so, but not everybody could go in. So mm -hmm. there had to be a, a rotating uh, crew. Somebody had to say, you know, okay, you're going to go in the morning, you're going to go in the afternoon, and so forth. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, out of that attempt to structure it emerged, um, uh, for example, uh, that uh, Skip Bumberg, I think, uh, probably working with Bart, uh, no, Bart wasn't there, with uh, Nancy Kane or... Um, mm -hmm. Maureen Orth was focused mm -hmm. on how the media covers the convention. And uh, Maureen was the kind of insider. You know, she wasn't yeah. a, a video freak. Uh, yeah, per se. Yeah. Yeah. And she was good in the interview style. Um, she has there's some very nice encounters uh, with her on the floor of yeah. the convention. Yeah. But. Uh, and, and you know there's she did the uh, Gonzo interview with Kissinger on the way into some event. Yeah. You know, it's like that was not a sit down interview, obviously, but um, yeah, yeah. And there is some just identified footage from three weeks ago, something like that, in which Maureen is interviewing John Lewis, who you know, is like in his early 30s at that point or his late 20s. That's and right. He was like a youth organizer. You yeah. know, get out the boat youth organizer. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but she had forgotten. I didn't know that, you know, until yeah. I saw that that clip recently. Yeah. 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 There are several other things that have percolated to the surface like that. And then yeah. also, of course, uh, Willie Brown appears as a character. Uh, too. I, I don't know if he was interviewed by TVTV, TV, but, um, you know, now he's like a retired politician, you know, who has a mm -hmm. column in the San Francisco Chronicle. Well, there is some very funny footage of you with Willie Brown. You, it, There's footage that begins at the house in which you have a photograph, I think, of Willie Brown that you've discovered from someplace. Oh. And you say, I want him to autograph it. And they then document you going to the convention, going through these dense crowds, finally making it through onto the floor, seeing Willie Brown, walking up to Willie Brown and saying, would you autograph this for me? And he says, you got a pen? And you said, no. <laughs> 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 and he finds a pen. Oh. And autographs this photograph. But it was just such a buildup. And you go, Whoa, no pen. <laughs> I don't know who shot that. Maybe Doug. Uh, yeah. And it probably the photo went into the scrapbook, I think. Do you know? Yeah, and I, th I think that you also moved through a crowd of Boy Scouts. I think it's the same footage. Oh. Where there's, they're, they're just coming into the convention hall and you kind of are going against the current and walk right through their formation. Right. Okay. I know there's the uh, footage outside the convention hall with the the Boy Scouts, um, sort of a marching band. Mm -hmm. And that was, they, were, they must have been the an opening uh, act for the, you know, the television coverage of the last night uh, of mm -hmm. the convention. Um, but you, but there's also the footage, footage of like, like Ron Dellums, you know, who was uh, representing Oakland back in those days, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, some interesting footage. So what what about other hierarchies? One of, one of the things that Megan always talks about is how uh, within the collective, women had a more of a, a equal footing as far as taking on responsibilities, getting the necessary support, all of that. And there were a, a handful of really formidable women out there. Mm -hmm. what, what can you recall about that? Well, just that there wasn't, uh, that, that there was a kind of equal 
number of women involved. And uh, I think it was a reflection in a way of, of the, the larger uh, alternative video world, if, if you will, mm -hmm. especially in contrast to the architecture world that, that we were coming from, where uh, as, as students, you know, in my class, there were four women and 34 men in the, at the beginning. And, hmm. uh, you know, when we graduated, I think only two of the women made it all the way. So, <clears throat> so that was very, you know, the, I, you know, I don't, of course it wasn't, it was, a, it was a feminist moment. It was the beginning of uh, a wider understanding of feminism. And, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I don't remember having those discussions mm -hmm. at that time in 1972. It just seemed logical in a way. There, there was a sense of collectivity and equality within the, the mix of what we were doing there. Yeah. And, and like, likewise, I mean, you know, you could say that uh, the, you know, the cameraman is a kind of, you know, it's like a six shooter, you know. And it was, it would be traditionally a, a male job. And there's a photograph um, that I took of Doug Michael standing back to back with a, yeah. I think a CBS cameraman. Mm -hmm. and, you, and it had to be a man because they had to wear a huge backpack, you know, very heavy backpack and a thing, you know, a, a camera, a heavy camera, the network cameras, whereas the Porter Pack wasn't, it was 24 pounds, but <laughs> it wasn't uh, substantially heavy yeah. enough that the job required, you know, a strong athletic man to do, to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, Nancy Kane and, and uh, Wendy Apple in particular were, and Megan were all, you know, good camera, had experience, mm -hmm. were good camera operators, shooters. Yeah. And in a certain way, you can also find an analogous situation at the convention itself in, in the rough footage because the the presence of uh, uh, women like um, Bella Abzug and Betty Friedan, uh, you know, uh, having a, a lot of uh, gatherings and pushing uh, to be included more broadly in the democratic platform and all of that, it almost becomes an analog for the uh, collective work that uh, TVTV is doing, you know, that's more inclusive. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about, but you're right. What I always thought was interesting also was that the the democratic convention was very anarchic. <clears throat> And yet, then you go to the Republican convention, which was completely choreographed. Uh, and in fact, there are all all kinds of complaints, even from the networks, that it's it's so orchestrated that there's no spontaneity to capture. There's no, there's nothing. If it says someone's speaking at three fifteen, they're speaking at three fifteen, and so the two conventions seem uh, complete opposites. And it also seems at the same time that TV TV is gaining a certain kind of experience and skill set about the making of documentaries. So the the world's largest television studio is really uh, has, you know has messy edges, whereas the second work, four more years, is much more restrained, much more disciplined, and it it. it you know, they're finding their analogies in the events that are being documented. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, one of the newscasters on the floor of the convention, actually, uh, obviously not Roger Mudd, it must have been, you know, maybe Douglas Kiker, says it's a very boring, you know, orchestrated. I mean, it says exactly what you just said, mm -hmm. you know, it's just too predictable. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think another, uh, what's interesting is that the Democratic uh, tape was edited in a more collective 
I wasn't there, so but from what I understand, there were a lot of people in the editing room, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that gets reflected in the structure of the of the final tape. Whereas for the Republican convention, which I was involved with, it was it was just um, Schamberg and me and Megan, and then uh, Chuck Kennedy was there as but as a technical support person. So the decisions were a smaller group making mm -hmm. um, editing decisions. And was this also done in New York? In New York at the egg store. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So did you, uh, during either of the conventions, go to Flamingo Park? Uh, there, there, there was a specific crew. Uh, it was a video freaks. Uh, maybe it was Bart and Frank Cavastanti had not had actually followed some of the Vietnam vets from New York oh, and had started right. shooting yeah. with them prior to going to Miami. So that there was a case where they were focused entirely on that story, mm -hmm. uh, and that was in Flamingo Park. So I, I don't, I don't remember ever going to. Flamingo Park um, during the convention. Yeah. yeah, and there's also uh, Andy Mann, I think, shot footage oh, uh -huh. uh, there. And I, I believe Skip shows up at some point, maybe in the, in, in the first convention when it was more of the Krishna people and the peaceniks and yeah. you know, the, uh, the, the born-again Christians who were having it out with the Krishna folks. <clears throat> but um, no, because it had an interesting tension again between the control of the convention and then, you know, the kind of countercultural chaos that was elsewhere. Right. Some some of the most poignant footage uh, is um, in the, in the former years doc, and then a lot of source footage. Uh, is where, um, you know, they'd started to tear gas the Vietnam veterans against the war. And there's a point in which uh, uh, a bus has arrived filled with Republicans and they have to get from the bus to the convention. Oh, that's and right. The tear gas is wafting in. <laughs> and it's the only time when you're inside the convention hall where the outside world seems to have leaked in. <laughs> You know, because everything else, again, is just this controlled event staged for the camera, uh, except when the doors are open and in comes the tear gas, <laughs> the unavoidable. And fortunately, there was a TV TV crew there inside. Well, that, it's edited between the outside and the inside, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, as these young Republicans were coming in, uh, you know, there was somebody there to ask them what, what was going on outside. And uh, that's where you get that statement, uh, you know, they should be shot or something extreme like that. I don't remember exactly, uh, you know, which was a young Republican. Yeah. And I mean, isn't it amazing how, how much of that feeling is being mirrored this year in the, mm -hmm. in the election and the conventions, of course, uh, Trump went well beyond anything Nixon could have imagined in 1972, but mm -hmm. uh, and it's the but it, and it's the nerve-wracking thing because we had great hopes for McGovern, <laughs> and he was just slaughtered. Yeah. Uh, there's also a wonderful moment in four more years. Um, I think it's only in the rough footage, though, where uh, there's a quick interview with Trisha Nixon. And she's, you know, this is the year that 18-year-olds could first vote. It was in 1972. And so they have all those young Republicans there. But Trisha Nixon says, Nixon is the candidate of youth. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's you, right. You just, it, in, in the new the new idea of gaslighting, it just seems like how could you possibly say that to me? You know, like he's the candidate for youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, both of the daughters were interviewed. I think I, I think Maureen yeah. Orth must have done one of those. I think Alan Walker shot that. I'm not sure. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm currently looking for some Ellen Rucker footage. <clears throat> yeah, he and uh, he and Hudson told me the story about uh, when they interviewed um, um, was it Tammy Wynette and uh, George Jones, or is it Loretta Lynn? Maybe it's Loretta Lynn and George Jones. <laughs> that was look at my sense. notes. Anyway. Um, but the the point being is that uh, I they interviewed them and the interview got a little messy. I won't get into it, but eventually uh, they hand the camera to George Jones and he shoots the rest of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been searching for that footage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that would be very good. Maybe yeah, the camera, also... maybe the tape wasn't rolling at that moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he might have turned it off inadvertently. <laughs> So it, after the second convention was over with and you went up to New York and you were involved with the edit, but after that, you basically separated from TV TV. I mean, Hudson's stick with it, but uh, the rest of Ant Farm basically drew back from the rest of the projects. That's right. <laughs> Because I think the well, next first thing of all, uh, <clears throat> yes, I you know the 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 project in uh, Texas was uh, not completed for another six months. Really, uh, we did in the fall of '72 um, after the conventions. Uh, a couple months later, uh, we Anfam had a project. Uh, the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston was opening a new building. And for the inaugural exhibition, we uh, proposed it making a time capsule, and it would include video. And for that, uh, Alan and Hudson drove from San Francisco. And uh, Schamberg came also, I think. So the, the shooting of the video for some period of time there around the end of October uh, was you know, like a, there was still like this mixture, let's say, mm -hmm. between the TV, TV personnel. And um, I guess, I'm not sure when the editing of four more years was, but it's true. I, Doug and I drove back to Houston, then I went to New York and uh, was involved in the editing um, of four more years. So, <clears throat> but, uh, so after this project in, um, October, um, we just continued to push forward with the finishing of the house in, in Texas. That was the mm -hmm. main focus. Um, during that period of time, the TV TV crew was really coalescing around a more making a like a business plan. And there's the forget the name of the booklet. It was like a an analysis of television at this moment. Curtis yeah, I think they was prime time the prime time survey. survey yeah. Curtis yeah. was very involved with that as, you know, a graphic designer. And Hudson was in San Francisco and I think, you know, just gravitated towards uh, that project. But um when we when Doug and I came back to San Francisco from Texas, there was a definite tension building between the two groups in terms of what you know would be uh, well, what would be required. You, could you be a member of both groups? You know, mm -hmm. no, you had to you had to choose. And uh, we and farm we had a uh, grant from the National Endowment for the Arts for to do an exhibition. Uh, which was was going to be in Houston at the Contemporary Art, Arts Museum. So that was that was a funded project, and that was a, a kind of demanding of our time. So that's one aspect, uh, and and Hudson was involved in that. So Hudson had you know was feeding both zones yes. yeah. uh, at that time, and um, and I did some 
uh, work on the the project Adland. Um, oh, okay. there was it was sort of that was like Rucker Alan Rucker's project mm -hmm. to as producer. And I think Schamberg at that time was more, you know, focused on a larger, long range vision. And eventually out of that came a contract with WNET uh, to, to do uh, produce however many works for public television. Yeah, yeah. So those are briefly the, the forces of, uh, of tension. <laughs> uh, at work, and uh, it became necessary to choose your uh, commitment and affiliation later yeah. in 1973. Yeah, and the move to Los Angeles was even more concrete as far as, right? Uh, you know, are we pursuing an occupation or a recreation? <laughs> <laughs> that sent a message, yeah. <laughs> I, I was looking not too long ago uh, at, a, at an issue of um, Video and the Arts uh, in which you uh, organized that article looking at TV TV 10 years later. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 And you had little updates on, well, uh, four or five people didn't respond to your uh, survey, but uh, you had a considerable piece of TV TV resurfacing probably 20 people uh what they were doing at that point and that wonderful uh photo uh of everyone around the the uh the media van it might have been better to wait another five years to do that <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know if video and the arts would be have a yeah. different name for the publication or would it even <laughs> exist yeah an issue later, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So are there any final reflections on TV, TV? Oh. Uh, participation? It, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it is an, an important record of that, that moment, you know, and of course important because it was uh, the, the first time Porter Pat footage was actually broadcast. So that was like a technical barrier that was broken at that point in time. Sorry. Uh, and, you know, especially looking back from this distance, it's, um, it probably offers like, like, as we mentioned, Steve, you know, John Lewis was there, other characters within the political realm, uh, of America that, um, you, you know, so, so, I mean, this is all to say that it's the project that you're doing, archiving the footage and these interviews is probably a very worthwhile idea. There's still yeah, things I mean, to be learned from that experience, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I also I so. wanted to say I was, uh, it was my crew, I think it was me and Tom Morey who were there when uh, Ron Kovac and the other two Vietnam vets uh, got admitted the last night of the convention, of the Republican convention, to the floor um, when McCloskey gave them his credentials and it, they were able to get right in. And during Nixon's speech began, you know, stop the bombing chanting. Mm -hmm. That was very moving uh, unbelievable to be right there uh, on that moment. And yeah. uh, so you were on the floor when that was happening. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I have a slide I took of Nixon giving his uh, his you know acceptance speech. Would have been that same that same time. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, of course the you know the the networks uh, all chose not to show the vets, not to show this little, you know, three person mm -hmm. counter protest in the midst of the, of the celebration of Nixon's um, acceptance. But when we were editing, of course, we used that footage. And then the, the balloons became this 
that they drop, you know, became a kind of metaphor of bombs dropping. And they, they were chanting, stop the bombing, stop killing mm -hmm. innocent people in Vietnam. So, yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard um, several stories about that uh, that moment, about different people claiming it was their uh, press credentials that got Ron Kovic in the building. Ah, yeah. <laughs> it's a badge of courage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I thought it was McCloskey. I don't know if if that's whose whose credentials it, it was. Yeah. Yeah. But, and of course, uh, you, you know, when the film, the Oliver Stone film was made, uh, it's essentially, you know, born on the 4th of July, it's essentially restaging um, TV, TV footage of Ron Kovic. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So that, that had to be based on the TV, TV footage in some, yeah. some degree, you know. Yeah, very distinctly. Well, okay. I think I think we can call this an end. Okay, cut. Thank you. <laughs>